Thank you. All right, so as you mentioned, we're going to have sort of a moderated discussion with all our speakers, and then at the end, we will try and save some time for questions, because I know there are a lot of questions, but this is one of these sessions that could probably last for three hours, and these guys would keep going and giving us tons of information. So let's try and keep the questions short and to the point if we can. But first, let's start with a round of applause for all our speakers again, because it was really fantastic talks. <laughs> Thank you. So I think one of the take-homes that we can get from all these talks is that nutrition is confusing, especially when it comes to nutrition and health. And there's science, there's what's practical, there's what, you know, what people are going to do, what about the person in front of you, there's individual variability. And a big problem is how do we construct all this in easy to digest information so we can communicate it. And one of the things that comes up is this, uh, this maybe a false dichotomy like Lane was talking about, of, of the energy balance versus carbohydrate insulin. So first question for the speakers is, is this helpful? Do you think it's helpful to have these discussions about energy balance versus carbohydrate insulin model? Or does it just confuse things and we need to restructure the conversation in a way that maybe is more uh, impactful for the average person? So I know that's a big topic, but I'd love to hear your input on that general topic. So Lane, you've got the mic. Why don't we start with you? Well, I think you make a really good point, which is how do you generalize enough to where you can put it out to a lay audience and they can digest it and then go and use it uh, without losing the nuance and creating like weird associations in people's minds. Because I think, you know, I've kind of come from a different perspective than I think a lot of people have, which is I've coached a lot of folks, especially in, you know, like fitness competitions, those sorts of things. And I just saw rampant amounts of eating disorders uh, and disordered eating patterns from people who had kind of like taken food rules, whether it be carbs are bad, sugar is bad, processed foods are bad, I can't have these. And the weirdest thing happened where they would try to avoid, 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 and then they'd end up caving because they have this idea that this is bad, I can never have it at all. And I think one of the things I've said is it's important to understand why stuff works so that you don't make those really strange associations in your mind. Because I've just seen the downstream consequences of that. And ultra-processed foods aren't going anywhere. You know, we can't, at least in my mind, it's going to be really hard to put the bullet back in the gun, right? So I think it's important to learn how to live with this stuff. Now, I think, do I think as a generalized advice, trying to avoid processed foods, trying to avoid things high in sugar, trying to avoid things in added oils and fats is pretty good dietary advice. Yeah, I think in general it is. But you have to be flexible with that rather than a rule because otherwise this is when you wind up, you know, you're at your kid's birthday and you have a little sliver of cake and all of a sudden you've, you know, eaten the entire thing because you have this idea that, well, this is bad. Any amount's bad. I've already gone through, I've already gone into it, so I might as well just have however much I want. And you'd be surprised how many people I've seen have actually struggled with their weight because of that mindset. So to answer your question, I do think it's important that people understand why these different things work while still presenting them with the options. And the one, the one thing I'll say is if you look at successful diets you know, across different cultures, the one thing they really have in common is they don't eat a ton of processed food, and it tends to be, you know, low energy density, right? Whatever gets you to that will work, but, you know, for different people, you know, different approaches may be better, whatever gets them there. Yeah, having been uh, part of this for a couple of decades, I think the debate often gets pretty stupid, actually. <laughs> where we argue, is it carbs or is it energy balance? And I think it's pretty clear that, yes, calories in, calories out, of course, but that's not really interesting. The interesting question is, how do you manipulate that in a way that works? So it's like saying, how do you get rich? Well, make more money than you spend. It's not helpful. You need better advice than that. And you know, how do you eat fewer calories than you burn? Well. That's the interesting question, how, not that you need to do it. And low carb is a way to do that. It's been shown in many studies, at least if you do it in a good way, 
like I talked about, uh, it can certainly be effective. But there are other ways to do it too. And I think this satiety lens is really powerful. And it's like you said, Lane, uh, energy density, if it's, high, if, it's, if it's lower, that's helpful. If you eat less ultra-processed foods, it's helpful because they tend to have all of these problems. And, and again, like I talked about, there is not a, it's, it's not a huge conspiracy or a, or a weird coincidence that ultra-processed foods have all of these problems because they've been designed to have everything that drives you to eat more because that is what works to bring more profit to the food in industry. So we have that to fight against. And I agree again that ultra-processed foods are not going to disappear. So we need to, I think, learn to live with that and try to find ways to guide you to less harmful ultra-processed foods or you know, less, less processed foods, ideally. But in, in, in uh, conclusion, I think the way to reach a, the energy balance you, you want is to eat quality food, eat better and everything else will figure itself out. It's been shown in many studies. You can eat intuitively as much or as little as you want if the food you eat has a better quality and a better satiety. So over evolution, no one had to worry about, is this too many carbs? Is this too many calories? It worked itself out. So what's your perspective on how we take that lesson to modern day society? Yeah, so one of the things I think, as you both were talking, I, I thought about, number one, and we mentioned it a couple times in the past few minutes, a few minutes was diversity. The thing that I see looking at our diets through time and also our, our contemporary diets around the world, that there's no one solid fast rule for, for any time in the past. I mean, I tried in 40 minutes to talk about three and a half million years worth of dietary change, and it's impossible to do without making generalizations. But I also think we, gotta, we have to continue the conversation and realize that even though everybody in this room is incredibly smart and well-learned and understands a lot about food, we only know a small piece of what food does with our bodies, and there's a lot more to learn. So I'll, I'll give a very quick example. We, um, several years ago, went and spent time with Samburu warriors in Kenya, and were drinking the blood milk thing that they do, just like the Maasai, and it was brilliant. And when we, it took us days to even get to this village. It was so remote, and when I saw the warriors who, who met us first. It looked like a Disney movie. They were back later. The sun. It was gorgeous. They were, of anybody I've ever met, and this is anecdotal, I'm sorry, but, it, <laughs> but th this, they were, from what I could see, their form, the way they held themselves, their teeth, their eye, everything was literally the health. It, it spoke health. It was true health. And uh, uh, as a full population, from what I observed, full health. They eat twice a day blood and milk. And for certain parts of the year, during the dry season, the men and the boys only drink raw blood and milk twice a day. That's it. And I came home, like, oh, that's fascinating. And then I was, I was teaching at Washington College. We were engaged the week after I got back to talking about um, food security and nutrition and all this. And I'm sitting in this room thinking to myself, I'm here in Maryland. I left a group of the healthiest people I've ever been around. And the two foods that are their staples out of that, one is illegal and one is incredibly hard for me to even get in this state and would never even enter into a conversation that we're having about food and diet and health. So continuing the conversation, understanding the diversity in our human diets, I think is, is very powerful. I think we also need to understand that we all have different goals and we all have different agendas. And when you look at the big picture of what are we trying to get across, I think most of us like to think that we're all pretty intelligent and pretty critical thinkers these days. And I think we can take bits and pieces of these nuanced discussions, where they fit, when they fit, and apply them. And I always use the context of a brick in the wall. Like, we know that energy balance is important, okay? But some people really thrive on learning that whole brick in the wall, that little piece. Why is this working? Why is this potentially not working? Why do I thrive on this, and why does Bob not thrive on this? So I think having a nuanced or very detailed granular discussion really works well as long as both sides are able to reach across the aisle a little bit and acknowledge the other person's discussion. You know, Lane and I have gone head to head online a number of times for years and it took both of us sort of being like, hey, let's let each other's sides listen to each other's sides and there's been a lot of positive crossover. So my point in saying that is that rather than having a dogmatic approach, I think when we're talking to the masses, we can get as detailed as we want, 
but we just need to drop the dogmatic approach when we're talking to the masses, because what the masses think a scientific debate is, is a boxing match. But in reality, it's usually an intellectual discussion. So with social media and everything that's happening in the masses, we all need to just kind of drop our guard and let ourselves be a little bit of Play-Doh for a minute and allow ourselves just a little bit of molding to occur so that we can start to understand both sides. And with that, then maybe we can all work together and figure out, hey, maybe insulin does play a role here. Hey, maybe calories do play a role here. Hey, I've got an idea. Why don't we all put it together and see what secret sauce we can figure out? And so the, now there's this concept of personalized nutrition. Every, you, know, you see these companies, whether it's your microbiome, whether it's your genetics, that there is a different diet for different people. And so, Andreas, you gave some great examples of the Katavans, of the Hadza. Um, you know, Katavans with greater than 50% of their calories from carbs, but doing great. But a lot of it also comes down to the lifestyle, the evolutionary lifestyle that Bill's referring to, that... Do we, need to, do we need to be more specific and personalized for a lifestyle? So people who are active in bodybuilders are gonna do better one way. People who are getting sunshine and, and moving their bodies all day are doing another. And people sitting behind a desk all day, maybe they need to worry about more about carbs and insulin. Do you see lifestyle playing in as fitting that personalization? So we're not talking about genetics, we're not talking about microbiome, we're talking about how you live your life in different different patterns of eating work better in those different scenarios? It's a good question, but it also begs the question of what do people identify with and what do they consider what silo they would be in, if that makes sense. A lot of people want to be bodybuilders, but they don't literally live the lifestyle enough to justify that kind of carbohydrate intake or that kind of protein intake. Or so then you kind of develop this almost brand where people will say, well, I'm this, so I'm going to eat like this, where it may not actually be in tune with what is truly biological and need, biologically in need. Um, you also have to ask the question, and I, I had Chris Palmer in my studio earlier this week, and I asked him this same question. I don't know if he's in here, but uh, you know, I used myself as an example. I, I ran my first marathon when I was 11 years old. I did a lot of endurance work. Did that, from an epigenetic standpoint, make me more predisposed to be better at a ketogenic diet? Like maybe that's why I've thrived so well. So we also have to ask ourselves a lot of these sort of, how are we brought up? Like what kind of, you know, and Chris mentioned to me, he said, well, I would almost argue that maybe you were born, you know, a, a poor carb oxidizer and you were just someone that just naturally went that way. So there's a lot of things that we couldn't necessarily tell just based upon what we like to do or what we brand ourselves. So that's where the difficulty would be. That being said, I think it's a completely viable and awesome idea, uh, you know, personalized nutrition. I think that's where it's headed. I think, you know, you take a look at people in West Africa that are running around, moving a lot. You look at the Kenyans that are running a lot, moving a lot. Completely different energy substrate demands than someone that is doing something highly anaerobic and then sedentary the rest of the day. So there's no real answer from me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I also think it's more complicated than just humans, to be fully nourished as a human is much different than fully nourished as another animal. I mean, and I truly believe every time we take a bite of food, we're expressing to the world things about ourselves, our socioeconomic status, where we're from, our history, our family, our religion, our politics. So to be truly nourished, it's much more than meeting or exceeding our biological requirements. It's also being nourished in a cultural way and being nourished in an emotional way. So that um, individualized nutrition, I think, uh, becomes even more important when you take those factors into account. Yeah, I think, um, Bill, you just said something that made me think of something which, like, even satiety is super important, and we know that. But one of the things I'll, I'll say to people also is, like, people don't always eat just because they're hungry. Like, that's another thing that people don't realize. Like, think about the last time you went to an event that did not have food. Like, you, you probably can't remember a time, right? So food, it's not just this kind of like robotic where, um, you know, there's no one answer to all this stuff because it's not just um, energy intake and we're robots and we just eat less or whatever it is. It's also, well, food is part of our culture. It's part of how some people modulate stress, right? It's part of how some people bond and connect with other people. So trying to unpack this all when we look at individualized nutrition, I think a lot of what we go to and think about is, oh, we have different genetics, therefore we need different diets. I will tell you, I've looked 20 years ago, is it 20 years ago? 
no, 15 years ago, not quite that old, when I got into graduate school, I, I thought, okay, the future of nutrition will be we'll get people's genetic code, DNA, polymorphisms, and we'll do nutrition based on that, and we'll sort everything out. And they've done some of those studies, and I'll tell you right now, the, the, the conclusions have been really underwhelming. <laughs> it, it just does not seem to make a big difference. I think where personalized nutrition is really important is, yes, based on people's lifestyle, they're going to have vastly different energy demands. And I think one of the people, things I tell people to try and like make it easier is, you know, I think calories, obviously important because of how much energy you take in and energy toxicity and protein. I think if you just get enough protein and control your calories, I mean, you're 95% of the way there in terms of benefits. There's other things you can do as well, obviously. But whatever in that kind of fractional area that allows you to be adherent, because that's, that's kind of like the big pink elephant in the room nobody wants to talk about, is we argue about, well, this diet increases fat oxidation, and this diet uh, increases expression of this gene. Great. Can you stick to it for five years? Because if you can't, it's not going to nothing's going to change. And if you look at the long-term nutrition data on various different diets, there was just a meta-analysis done a few years ago of 14 popular diets spanning the gamut from low carb to high carb. Uh, and they found that after two years, there was absolutely no difference in fat loss between the diets. But when they stratified people into how adherent they were, regardless of diet type, there was a linear effect of adherence on reduction in body weight. So to me, what that says is the best diet is the one that trips your compliance algorithm. And we hear this, I've heard this from people in low carb, say, I did low carb, it felt like I wasn't even dieting, it felt easy. Heard it from people in intermittent fasting, felt like, oh, I just didn't feel like I was dieting. And for me, that was tracking my calories and still being able to eat the foods I like. But I also have a very high energy expenditure. I train multiple hours a day. So I'm probably able, to, if I was only training, you know, 30 minutes a day, and my energy expenditure was, you know, 1,000 calories per day lower, would I still be making the same food selections? I probably wouldn't be. Yeah. So I think really when we're talking about personalized nutrition is what is it for you, if you want to lose body weight, improve metabolic health, you have to restrict in some way dietarily. But you can pick the form of restriction that feels the least restrictive to you as an individual, and I think we don't talk about that enough. Well said. <laughs> oh, can clap, can clap. I think he wants to get booze still, but somehow we keep clapping for him. Huh? <laughs> okay, Brett, you're gonna get me into trouble. I'm trying. So, so I, I promise to be be nice um, to exhibitors and stuff. Um, I guess I, I can um, refer to what uh, Lane said. There's no convincing evidence that you can personalize your nutrition based on. Uh, some of these uh, testings that are available. In fact, when this was uh, investigated, then uh, people who did all of these kind of analysis, they all ended up getting advice to eat less carbs and more protein. So maybe you could start with that without spending a lot of money on testing. <laughs> uh, that said, I think personalized nutrition is super interesting from another perspective because we all have personalized ideas about what we like to eat. And if we can build models that can guide people to foods that they love, that will still increase their satiety and increase their uh, ability to uh, eat less and still be, uh, still be uh, uh, satisfied and happy, then that, I think, is the personalization we should strive for. So since we're talking about satiety, and it was a great presentation about the satiety score, I love that video showing how when you add different foods to, to the foods, the, the satiety score changes. But as Bill said, we didn't need satiety scores. We didn't need a, a, um, something to tell us what to do. And let's face it, scores are complicated, right? Has everybody heard of the food compass score out there? What does everybody think about the food compass score? Boo, right? Like frosted flakes are better than eggs and ground beef. Okay, that's because that's coming from one specific perspective of how to look at food, which doesn't apply to a lot of people. So you're taking this on with a satiety score and getting some pushback in social media. 
for, you know, someone will say, for me, macadamia nuts are so filling. I can only have a little bit. And someone else is going to say, I can go to town on macadamia nuts and never stop. So in a way, you're really putting a target out to say, this is a score. We're going to boil eating down to a score. So I'm curious what everybody thinks about that. Is it possible to have a functional score that's going to help people learn to eat better? Or do we just, or do we have to go back to saying, you know, what's going to work for each individual? Can't be boiled down that way. So I just want to touch on the genetic thing. I'm also not saying that in the future we might not have stuff that will help uh, based on genetics. I think a lot of what we've focused on is metabolism so far. And what we're really finding is the effective, whether it's, Nutritional interventions or drug interventions actually focus on appetite. Um, but, you know, I think here's the thing about scores. I think what you've done is great. I think that's fantastic, and I think it, in general it's a great thing to use for people. But I always tell people you can become too dogmatic about anything, right? I'm sure there's a way somebody could gamify the score to where they're consuming foods that might not be real great for them, but still score high, right? Like, I don't know what that would look like, but I think the important thing is, and I'll give the example of, you know, you were talking about like how there's like keto cookies now, right? It's like, well, aren't we kind of like missing the point here? You know, the, the point is by doing a ketogenic diet or a low carb diet, you're actually, it's hard, to, it, it was hard to do that diet and still eat a lot of processed food. But now, and I, I don't know if you all know Ethan Suplee, but he lost, uh, he was a Hollywood actor, lost 300 pounds, and he did a low-carb diet for some of his weight loss, and he got stuck. And he said, you know, I was just dumping oil on everything, on all my salads to make it more flavorful, um, and I was having some of these, you know, ketogenic treats, these ketogenic ice creams. Well, if you look at the ketogenic ice creams, they have more calories than the, the regular ice cream. So it's like, if you become too dogmatic about that, you can still gamify it enough to basically eat past it, right? And the same thing's true of plant-based. I mean, when the, the Game Changers film came out and they were talking about how great a plant-based diet was, and then they have these people like, well, you know, you could still eat really fun foods on a plant-based diet, and they're having vegan mac and cheese and vegan chicken wings and all this stuff, and it's like, but you're missing the point of why the plant-based diet is working for that person. It's because you're eating less calories but now you're showing this really calorie-dense food. And again, I'm not against people necessarily having some processed food because uh, getting back to the macadamia nuts, some people say, well, that's really filling, and other people say they're not filling. Well, some people eat certain foods under certain conditions just because of, like, social cues, like right down to social cues. For example, sit down on the couch, turn the TV on, oh, it's snack time, right? And people tend to overconsume food that way. So all that to say, this stuff's really complicated, and I think having general guidelines is great. But I think what we need to do a better job of is relaying to people in a palatable way that, hey, you can still screw up a general guideline if you're not careful, right? And I, like we've done it for decades now. Sorry, that was really long-winded. No. And, and that's a fantastic point. I mean, even we, we see it when the organic label came out. I mean, there were people that were on the committee that identified what organic meant, and as soon as it came out and everybody started to find all the loopholes, people quit the committee because for the same reason. I'd also like to say one, one other thing, and, and I think this makes it even a little bit more profound. So do we need people to tell us how to eat now? Do we need these sort, sort of scores? Unfortunately, yes, because we are so disconnected. We need that sort of guidance. But I do want to sort of reframe the way we think about our diets in the past. And this isn't to just put a romantic spin on it, but, and I live in the past way, probably way too much. Our ancestors were not surviving, right? And, and I'll tell you a very quick anecdote, but it, I think it drives it home. So right before I did The Great Human Race, my students wanted me to do, at the time, the new show, The, the um, Naked and Afraid. And I don't know if you ever saw this show, but they take two people that supposedly know each other, man and a woman, strip them naked and throw them, in the, throw them in the woods. And I would have nothing to do with Naked and Afraid. But I didn't want to tell the students I didn't want to do Naked and Afraid. So I said, all I'm going to do is I'm going to ask my wife. And she's going to say, there's no way you're going to do Naked and Afraid. And then I could tell the students I'd love to, but she said no. So I, I remember the moment I sat her down in our bedroom and I said, I, Christina, the students want me to do Naked and Afraid. She thought about it. it okay. And I, I said, whoa, all my dreams. Okay, wait, what do you mean? You know exactly what happens. They take a man and a woman that don't know each other. They're naked for 28 days in the middle of the woods. And she says, yes, I know. I've seen the show. And I said, well, she says, that's probably the safest place you could be. And I said, I don't understand. She goes, okay, after the first day or two, 
usually there's a guy and usually has some sort of romantic feelings and you can see it come through on the screen, but the reality is after a day or two and they're covered with poison ivy, they're starving, they're covered in mud, they're sunburned, the last thing on their mind is procreating. And, but, but this is a very important point because our ancestors were not just surviving. Species that are just surviving many times don't have babies, and those babies don't have babies, and those babies don't have babies. What we see in a revolutionary past for the past three and a half million years is not only do we see increases in population, but they were nourishing themselves to such a degree that our bodies and our brains were growing, growing at the same time in very powerful ways. They were crushing it. Their connection with their food and their decisions that they made on how to feed themselves and how to eke out every bit of nourishment in the safest and most efficient way possible from their food through technology was amazing. So we, we can get back to that, con that connection, but with the disconnect that we have now, we do need that sort of, sort of guidance for sure. I think we have to ask ourselves the question, how can we try to solve satiety when we can't even really completely solve anxiety and depression and these other things that are happening in our brains? Like, if you ask me, we don't know diddly squat about hunger signals, and that, that is the most, one of the most complex areas. Like, we don't fully know. We know small components. We know ghrelin, we know CCK, we know leptin, we know these things. And like, across all these different cohorts, it's just, it's all over the map. The more that I have learned about satiety, the more I have realized, like, holy crap, this is one of the most complicated things. Because when it gets down to just the neurological level, the neurochemicals, neurotransmission, everything, there's much more going on than any of us in this room have any idea of what's happening. So when you look at satiety, like sure, there's these simple cues that we could cross-reference and that we can reverse engineer a little bit, but then you factor in, you take that same exact situation, that person that seems satiated, and you make them go run 10 miles, and they're gonna eat in a compensatory fashion because they ran 10 miles and they feel like they're not overeating. So I guess my point with that is the problem with a satiety score is that it's not gonna factor in what is being driven by energy demand from a workout, like if someone's going out for a run and they're gonna compensate by eating way too much. And a lot of times I think what's gonna happen is once the mainstream kind of catches wind of a, of a satiety score is it's all just gonna circumnavigate back to fiber and we're just gonna hear a fiber discussion over and over and over again, which I have no problem with fiber, but when that just becomes sort of the common denominator of everything that's discussed, that's what it's gonna come back down to, because uh, it's gonna be simplified. So I think when we talk about satiety scores, it's way, way, way more individualized than we could ever possibly imagine. And I think we need to start at solving the metabolic issues that are happening in our brain and the mitochondrial dysfunction that's happening in our brain that is a serious epidemic before we can start trying to triangulate every single hunger hormone that may be, you know, terrible. Finally, a little controversy and discussion here. Andreas, let's go. Oh, that's great, thank you. Um, so I agree with most of uh, what was said. I, I totally agree that, you know, this is very complex and we don't know everything yet, no doubt. And so what we've done is we've tried to take the best available evidence we tried to triangulate with the top experts we could get our hands on, some pretty smart people, I would argue, and try to come up with the best we can do today. But this is a work in progress. This is an iterative process. You know, and, and, and as soon as we get better data, new data, we can train our algorithm on that and improve it. Uh, I do think, though, that we, we know some things that are sort of universally statistically on average true, even if there are individual, individual uh, variations and, and from time to time, you know, it may differ from day to day and, and all kinds of things, we still know some things that can, that can guide people. And we know from lots of studies that if you increase the protein percentage of, of what you eat, you will tend to eat less. I don't think that's all too controversial. Same thing with energy density. If you lower energy density, uh, you tend to eat less. Many, many studies show this. And if you eat you know, fat and sugar combos, you would tend to, tend to eat more. And that's probably true for, for most people. Even if, which is interesting, some people prefer ice cream, others prefer potato chips, which is fascinating. Yeah, but, but still, you know, on average, on average, people eat those kind of foods 
uh, they overeat them. They don't overeat cod and broccoli. You know, it's, it's not what you want when you're full, really. I don't think there is any exception from that. No individuality, individuality whatsoever. Nobody wants to eat uh, a steak when they're super full, I think. Uh, so I think there is something here. And, and sure, we can have people arguing whether macadamia nuts are satiating for them or not. And you know, if they do well on macadamia nuts, I'm not going to argue. But there are plenty of studies, again, showing that what's in macadamia nuts, very low protein, very high energy density, it all tends to correlate with eating more. And if you roast them and salt them, they become hedonic, and some people can just keep eating the whole bag. I know I can. So if you do well on macadamia nuts, I'm not coming to steal them, I promise. <laughs> but if you're not doing well, maybe try eating fewer. First off, I'm glad I wasn't involved in the first beef here today, so <clears throat> um, I think the other thing to, to keep in mind, and Andres, you kind of touched on it, is scientific studies report means, right? But you're not a mean, you're not a mean, you're not a mean, you're an individual, okay? Now, I think it's a great idea to look at studies and see what the averages show, because averages, if anybody's ever looked at a Gaussian distribution, 60 to 70 percent of people are going to fall within that space, that average space. So it's a great way to get an idea of where should I start. But there are outliers and there are people who just do better on certain things in terms of whether it's um, compliance or perhaps there is a genetic component to it, who knows. But I think starting with, okay, well these are what, these are the scientific studies that are pointing us in this direction but then being open-minded enough to realize like, hey, I don't care what this score says, um, you know, for whatever reason, I can eat five ribeyes at a time. I don't know, right? Like, but like something like that, like if you know that about yourself, that for you, this individual food is hard to moderate, well, fine, then, then don't eat it, right? And I think that's the, what gets lost in a lot of this discussion is, again, going back to my logical fallacies talk, if I say something about like, sugar not being independently fattening, I'm not saying as an advocate for sugar, I think in general it's a bad idea to consume it because of the energy density, but I think it's important to have enough nuance that people can understand that, hey, like not everybody's looking to lose weight. If you're an athlete and you're burning 5,000 calories a day, I mean, good luck getting in enough energy to support what you're doing if you're not eating some processed food, right? So there has to be enough nuance in this discussion that we understand Studies report means, but you are also an individual data point, and if you know you just do better with something, that's fine. Just be careful about how you try to apply that to other people. Very good. Now we can go to some questions here, so if people want to start going to the mics. But, so why, while people are going to the mics, the one point I want to make is, look, I, and I think it's great that you're the one sort of behind this and driving this, because if you, I don't know if you're following on social media, there's been a lot of feedback, um, and your response is, Generally, thank you. We're going to take that and we're going to and we're going to reiterate on it. Whereas you could say for other food systems or scoring systems, not to be named at the moment, there's been zero response, zero iteration. This is the way it is. Take it. And and so I think that you deserve a lot of credit for that. For saying you want to be less wrong and continue to be less wrong as you move forward. Thank you, Brett. Uh, I just want to make it clear that this is not my brainchild entirely, or even mostly. There are a lot of it's, it's basically based on some of the smartest researchers in this field, I would argue. Ted Nyman has been also uh, a, a core, core person building and iterating on this, so uh, I can't take credit for it. But certainly we'll keep iterating and improving based on feedback and, uh, of course, trying to base it on the best available evidence. So it's not, it shouldn't be opinion-based, but if people make a good point supported by data, will try to iterate and improve. Perfect. Question over on the mic. Hi. My name's Amelia, I'm from Seattle, and I'm a personal trainer. And I was just trying to clarify my question so it makes sense. Um, so we are social creatures, and we thrive in community. Um, one thing that Joan Iflin talks a lot about is mirror neurons. 
and how they have been negatively affected by advertising, by social cues, visual cues. You know, when we're at an event and everyone's eating cheesecake, well, that's telling me I can eat it too. So my question to you is, how do we reverse that um, negative impact on our mirror neurons and rebuild our mirror neurons to be in a, tribal, a positive tribal sense of eating healthy um, in sustainable ways? Essentially, how do we build more community that's accessible to lots of different people, especially marginalized communities, um, using whatever you have or you know, anything you'd like to offer around that question, if that makes sense? I mean, I think that's, uh, this is where I go, I'm glad I'm not in charge. Um, I think that's like a kind of a policy question, you know? Um, and I am not sure, to be quite honest. Um, I think uh, in the example you provided, I can address a specific example of what I recommend. And when we're talking about social events, you know, where hyper palatable foods available, I think one of the things that's really important is just like be mindful. Like mindfulness is so underrated when it comes to food. And what I mean by that is like having an actual like conversation with yourself when you go somewhere of, okay, you have kind of two ends of a spectrum of I'm going to completely indulge and enjoy myself and I'm not going to worry versus, oh my God, if I eat anything, I'll get fat, right? Neither of those two things are probably super helpful. So like when I go to a social event, usually I'll say, okay, I'll have an idea in my head of, by the way, it's not this complicated of a talk because I've been doing it for a long time, but I'll have a conversation, all right, am I going to have dessert? Am I, what am I going to have for dinner? Um, and usually I'm just going to have a play. I'm not, I, a friend of mine's a psychologist and she observed me one time and she's like, you know, you're really funny because whenever you have the option of what to eat, you will choose low calorie options by default. But then usually you won't, all, you won't turn down like high calorie options, you'll just have a serving of it and be done with it. And I think subconsciously I do that to kind of even things out. But it is a conscious decision. I've had times too where I've gone, you know what, I'm not gonna worry about like how much I'm eating right now if I'm with family or something like that. Like I don't eat to gluttony. I always tell people like there's never really a good reason to like eat like crazy full. But I'll eat till I'm full and then I'll be done with it, right? And I think having, being mindful about like what is the exchange you're going to value here? Do you want less experience and, you know, be more mindful of body composition? Or are you less worried about body composition and more worried about the experience? And I think that's a good way to start approaching things. But on like a meta level, I got no idea. <laughs> but, but on a per I wish I had better. But on a personal level, like Tom was saying, um, to figure out what's going on in your head. Right, to, to take care of that first. And that applies to everything in life, not just how we eat, but how we live our lives. And I think that's such a, an important perspective that for people just to be more introspective and mindful in general, and you know, again, that's a broad statement, but it helps in every way and then helps what's going on in your own mind. So I think that was a good point you made before. And to your point about uh, community and information, it, it, it's very, very simple. It's, it literally is all about connection. I mean, we are at a place now where we have deconstructed the entire food system stick people in boxes and computers and expect them to understand how, how and what to choose to eat. You know, and it used to be silly, like several years ago, I would go nuts because somebody would go to the grocery store and they'd think they're being healthy and they would buy nothing but chicken breast. Well, that, 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 and, and say, oh, I'm, I'm eating in an ancestral way because I'm eating nothing but meat and, and it's these chicken breasts. But nobody ate just chicken breasts in the past. And now we've turned that to ribeyes in the past few years. Everybody goes and buys nothing but ribeyes and I'm eating ancestrally. No, nobody ate just ribeyes in the past. And currently, it's gone the other way, and, and I'm a huge nose-to-tail advocate, believe me, for a lot of different reasons, but now we're advocating eating 50 pounds of bull testicles a day, and that's supposed <laughs> to be the way to do it. But the re even though I, I love some of the message for the whole complete animal, these, we are now asking questions that we never had to ask before. If you asked a hunter-gatherer 20,000 years ago, how much liver am I supposed to eat in a given day? He'd look at the animal he just killed and say, well, I'm going to eat that liver and that spleen and that heart, that kid, those kidneys and the fat and the meat, and then I'm going to go kill another animal. I don't understand the question. But we can now go to Whole Foods and buy 20 pounds of chicken livers and come home and say, how much am I supposed to eat? Right? So that connection, I mean, it, I truly, one of the things that we teach a lot of is home butchering. 
You know, bring a pig home, put it on your counter, and take it apart. And just do it once and have the kids involved. And then go back to your grocery store and look at the meat section. It is a completely different informed experience. So that sort of connection and learning to cook from scratch can help alleviate a lot of the questions that we have in trying to navigate our food system. For the brain, specifically, just by show of hands, I'm kind of curious. Have any, has anyone experienced where you've been on your phone a whole, whole lot in a particular day? Okay, you're getting constant dopamine hits, okay? And then you put the phone down, and there's like this massive void that needs to be filled, so you go to the pantry and you start eating. Please don't tell me I'm the only one. Okay, because I have talked to hundreds of people with this exact question, and when they actually look down and they think about it, they're like, the more constant dopamine hits that I'm getting, it's almost like they're transferable into other areas of our life. And we see that with sleep, we see that with all kinds of things, right? So my point in saying that is that, you know, you go into the social setting, you've got this bombardment of oxytocin, bombardment of all kinds of things, massive glutamatergic, you know, action happening. That's probably just almost like invasion of the body snatchers in some ways. So your question is like, how do you kind of take control of that? And although, like Brad said, there's being mindful and meditation and doing what you can to be aware of that and become very, very present, you know, independent of that, you know, one of the things that I always do is I drink a crap load of water before I go into a social setting. So then I'm pretty full. And then, or maybe I'll even have like a little bit of chicken or a little bit of steak or something before I go into a social setting. So that is at least alleviating some of that like visceral response that I might have to just wanting to grab something to eat. Um, you know, it kind of counters what I was saying about satiety scores, right? I mean, protein, yeah, it does satiate me. But I think in a simple, simple way, we have to take a little bit of control of what we can take control of physically before we ever really try to solve everything that's going on up here outside of being mindful. All right, and unfortunately we're running out of time, which I knew we were gonna do because these guys just all have so much, um, so much advice and, and information to give. Why don't we go for one last question here and then it'll be a lunch break, but I'm sure they'll be around to answer more questions, so. Thank you, Brett. So a wise old biologist once said that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I recently tweeted that nothing in human nutrition makes sense, except in the light of evolution. Some people claim that I was making a fallacious uh, appeal to nature. Others said, no, I think you're exactly right. I'd love each one of your input. Should we only focus on the latest nutrition research and, and consider an, a, a, an appeal to evolution, an appeal to nature, which is a fallacy? Or should we try to circumspectly wrap all of this up into a bow and say, all this matters? And, and the past really does matter almost as much, if not more, than the latest nutrition research. I'd love each of you to, to comment on that. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. I mean, I completely agree. A uh, huge fan of, of using an evolutionary lens to think uh, about food because we are, we are human animals. We are the uh, result of, of course, millions of years of evolution eating the foods we ate. But, but like, uh, like Bill and everybody has been talking about, of course, we ate all kinds of foods. We ate anything we could get our hands on in nature, right? So uh, it's hard to say exactly, exactly what that was. Certainly it wasn't, you know, keto all the time, unless you were a very rare, in a very rare place. Um, yeah, it's not where we evolved at least. So, but I think that uh, much of these things we've been talking about, they make a lot of sense from evolutionary perspectives. We didn't have ultra processed foods, right? None of that. Uh, and and they, they are really diluting the nutrients, the, the protein, the vitamins, the minerals with added energy. And, and so that doesn't make sense from an evolutionary perspective. And, and higher protein percentage diets, I think, make a lot of sense, whether you eat uh, animal products or vegetable products. As a percentage, protein tends to be higher. Same with energy density. Certainly used to be lower wherever you lived, pretty much. Fiber, if you look at all the data we have available, most likely people ate far more fiber than today. 
and hedonic foods, hyperpalatable foods, were not even invented. So good luck finding a donut. Yeah, I actually love this question because um, my PhD advisor, Don Lehman, who uh, is going to be here later, he would always ask me, why? why? Why do you think the body evolved to be like this? And I'd be like, come on, man, I'm just trying to get my PhD. Like, I have to answer these questions? Um, but it really, it would get the wheels turning. So I think there's, I have two parts to address this. The first one is, I think, just what you said, which is, you know, what we adapted on was very regionally specific. You know, you can go and you can look at, you know, labeled isotope data, and you could see people who were closer to the ocean likely consumed more fish, more seafood. People who were more inland, if they were away from herds, they consumed more of a, you know, quote-unquote plant-based diet. Uh, people who were around more herds, they used more animal products. And so, and if you look at human digestion, you look at the way we're put together, we're pretty well equipped to deal with most things. We're actually kind of a jack of all trades in many ways. Uh, unfortunately, we can't eat grass. We're not ruminants. Uh, you can, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, that's about the one thing that we can't do. But then what do you, what do, you do with that information, I guess, is, is kind of where I come from. And if we look at, you know, the, what we're dealing with now, which, you know, the, there's, there's kind of, if we talk about body fat set point, there's kind of two governors on that, right? You've got your upper end which prevents you from getting too fat, and you've got the lower end preventing you from getting too lean. And if you look at the governors of each, which has the stronger governor? Well, at high ends of body fat, what is the risk evolutionarily? Well, it's basically a risk of predation, or you're going to be so slow that you're not able to, you know, chase after something or chase down an animal or whatever it is, which that problem actually solves itself because then if you're not eating, you get skinnier. <laughs> um, but the, the risk of predation since man has been able to use tools is basically non-existent. I mean, you know, yes, people get attacked by a shark every once in a while or something random. But for the most part, animal attacks on humans are basically just random events of, you know, entropy. But the risk of starvation, even in this country a century ago, was still a very real risk. Those are genes that have been passed down for years. This kind of gets into the thrifty gene hypothesis, which is those of our ancestors who survived and passed their genes on were likely the most resistant to famine. And so we're set up with this genetic makeup to prevent us from starving, to keep us from starving, because that is the biggest threat to survival in terms of historically speaking, because our genes don't change that fast over one or two generations. And now you go from that to you start to hit the 1950s where people, you know, become a little bit less active and you have a little bit more hyperpalatable food to up to the 1980s with this explosion of hyperpalatable food. And it's not just that, it's, it's packaged and you can find it anywhere and it's cheap and it's not now just at your candy shop, you know, because even in the 60s and 70s, if you wanted something, you know, like cookies and stuff, you go down to the bakery, right? Like you don't just go to Walmart and you can get everything. So I guess it's absolutely applicable, but I think the reality is, is okay, with just what you were talking about, we have this information, how do we use it to get people to consume less, right? Because at the end of the day, even these weight loss drugs that have come out, which have been wildly successful, work because they're appetite suppressants. They get people to eat less, which I find it funny because I've had some people say, you know, my metabolism is broken, I can't lose weight, so I want to take one of these. I'm like, well, these won't help you then because they don't increase your metabolic rate. They just get you to eat less. So if you're already eating as much as you say you are, they're probably not going to work. But I think the point is, yes, calorie, don't, don't throw stones at me. Calories in, calories out matters. But that does, that's not the same thing as tracking calories. How do we get people to get into the negative energy balance that we need in order to get these benefits? That is the real question. And so far, we don't really have a great answer for that. That was an excellent question. And the short answer is, in my mind, 
yes, it's, we take it as an entire package. We need to realize, so to me, and I mentioned it at, at the end of my presentation, I don't believe the ideal human diet has yet to be created. However, the, our, an evolutionary perspective, that is, that is the diet. Our evolutionary changes in our diets through three and a half million years literally built us as a species. And there's no separation between those dietary changes and our evolutionary change. They're intricately linked. Here we are today in bodies that are 300,000 years old. We are in Stone Age bodies living in a modern world. So it, our digestive tract is the same. Now, there, there's little nuances because of environmental factors, but our digestive tract is the same size. Our teeth are the same size. Our brains are the same size. Our nutritional requirements from those perspectives are the same. But we're living in a modern world with all of the other trappings of what that means economically, socially, you know, and, and the list can go on and on. So from my perspective, the best way forward is to take that entire package, use as a foundation that evolutionary approach that tells us, you know, as, as best as we can, what it is that got us in, into these bodies, and then use all of the new information for the good to try to figure out how to navigate this incredibly complex modern food system and all the rest of, of what it means to be a human today. Very, very well said. That's. If we look, we don't even fully understand a lot of pieces of our past, let alone nutrition. Okay, what's that guy's name, uh, Graham something or other that was on Rogan? You know who I'm talking about. Like he's, he's hated by half the world and embraced by half the world. Essentially, he's kind of challenging every single like historical marker. Yes, yeah. You know, like, hey, did we have intelligent life uh, before this ice age? And like... It got me thinking, it's got Joe Rogan thinking, it's got millions of people thinking like, what do we actually know is historically accurate? Like we don't know 100%, right? We can only make educated guesses and we can look and reverse engineer things to a certain degree. I'm gonna use a terrible example, but it paints a picture because I know that a lot of people here probably have uh, similar feelings when it comes down to the blue zones. But let's take a look for a second and I'm not gonna talk about the longevity piece. I'm talking about if we, are touting blue zones as its optimal longevity diet. How come each and every blue zone is so drastically different? The only common denominators, and don't worry, I have a point with this, the common denominators generally are the social piece or the activity piece. Um, you know, there, there's a few different common denominators, but I really worked hard at trying to analyze, like, what is it that are the outliers with each specific region? not the common denominators. Maybe it's the outliers that are causing a positive effect. Maybe in Costa Rica, it's polyphenols from XYZ. Maybe in Greece, it's more omega-3s. Maybe in Sardinia, it's more. So let's look at these outliers. And my point in this is maybe we could look at it from an evolutionary standpoint as well. Okay, if you take, what are the outliers from indigenous tribes that are in the prairies versus coastal? What was it that was making them thrive? Let's stop looking at it half glass empty and saying like, oh, when did they die? What caused the problem? What were the common denominators? And let's find what made them excel. What made a coastal region excel? Okay, maybe it was omega-3s, maybe it was this, maybe it was that. And sure, we can dovetail it nicely into a simple discussion on like, yes, you should just eat this proper uh, human style of diet, and that makes sense. But now we have the ability to analyze these things. So I take, say we take all these gold standards from each region from an evolutionary standpoint, and we use that to our advantage today and craft what could really be a proper way to eat based upon these advantages of each and every food group that was available to us historically. I think that's a great way to end it, and I really apologize for running long, but I sure think it was well worth it. I love this discussion. So let's hear it for our, our panel here. Thank you.